Coming up, Nixon gets a second chance on Ferguson. Is he getting it right this time? As local gay couples get the right to marry for the first time, testing the limits of those rights. City Union Mission under fire for excluding gay married couples. And as we head towards Thanksgiving, what does Kansas City have to be thankful for? Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. We appreciate you inviting us into your home again this week as we roll up our sleeves to take you behind the headlines, making news in our metro, sitting around the cozy confines of our Week in Review table to dissect those stories from the call newspaper. Senior writer Eric Wesson is with us. So is Dana Wright from 98.1 from uh, KMBZ. Or is it Dana Ketz? <laughs> Congratulations on your brand spanking new marriage to TV news anchor Chris Ketz. Thank you. Absolutely. From 41 Action News. Garrett Hake, who has nothing to celebrate other than the sheer joy of being <laughs> on this program. And rounding out our news reviewer, star political reporter, columnist and blogger, Dave Helling. Now, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon was blasted for how he responded to events in Ferguson this summer. He showed up in the town five days after the shooting. He was savaged on social media for his absence. Now the two-term Democrat is trying not to make the same mistake again. Violence will not be tolerated. This week, the governor declares a state of emergency and activates the National Guard ahead of a grand jury decision about whether a white police officer should be charged in the shooting death of 18-year-old Michael Brown. In addition, Nixon announced that more than 1,000 police officers have received specialized training in crowd control with an emphasis on the constitutional rights of demonstrators. And he insists law enforcement have been working hard to forge contacts with churches, schools, and businesses in Ferguson. Governor Nixon was in Kansas City this week during a speech at Lincoln Prep High School. He faced a silent protest from about a dozen students. Are those Kansas City high schoolers a barometer of how people feel about Jay Nixon's response to Ferguson? Or is there a general feeling that the governor is getting it right this time, Garrett? Uh, I don't think the governor gets any benefit of the doubt this time around. He acted in front of this by calling out the National Guard, but then absolutely fumbled the response on a conference call with dozens of if not hundreds of reporters from around the world asking him if this meant he was in charge, does the buck stop with him? He had no answer. If you're going to use executive authority to, to make a powerful uh, optic statement oh, no. and, a, and a powerful move, you have to back it up. No, on your oh, radio God. station, you were playing that over and over again. It's it, it seemed to last and uh, go on forever. Someone said on our text line they haven't heard that much stuttering since Ozzy Osbourne's reality show. <laughs> I mean, God. it is bad. He sounds unsure of himself, indecisive. He couldn't even answer the question, are you in charge? How hard is it to say, yes, I am the leader of the state and I'm in charge? He missed an enormous opportunity with those high school students in their silent protest. He didn't even acknowledge it. What a great opportunity to say, let those kids protest. That is their constitutional right. They're being respectful. They're being quiet. They have the right to do that. And we hope the adults take a cue from that and act the same way in Ferguson. He missed an enormous opportunity at Lincoln Prep there. He looks out of touch and completely indecisive. And he's got to get ahead of this. Not that it's not an enormous job to do so. It would be difficult for anyone to do it. But he has to look more in charge than he does. The Kansas City Police Chief Chief Daryl Forte has been making the rounds on the TV stations and other area media this week and, and said he was impressed by what the governor has been doing, including uh, the order to bring in the National Guard, Eric Wesson. Yeah, he's been been saying that, but the police department insists that they've got things under control here locally. It was probably something that was politically correct for him to do. But Nixon if he had a done it or not done it, activated the National Guard, whether he said anything or not, he's still behind the eight ball in this whole incident because he didn't react to it at first. And if you really go deeper into it, this happened during his watch as the Attorney General because he did the disparity study and racial profiling there. So he knew that the problems existed there. So we come back here 12 years later and we've got the same issues, same problems that we had when he was attorney Dave. general. Yeah, I, you, you want to give Governor Nixon a little bit of room here because the answers are all difficult. And any of us in the same position might also struggle. Although I think the panel is right, the problems really go back some time. It isn't his specific reaction this time in isolation that we should focus on. 
uh, you know, the, the, the verbal tick of the governor stuttering, it, it, reporters have, uh, you know, seen that in him for years. He, yeah. he, he, at news conferences, he acts like that all the time. But he did not understand that in this situation, any hesitancy would be seen as a sign of weakness, and he needed to really, really focus on what he was saying. Um, and there's also a question, Nick, and we'll need to pay attention to this, uh, as to whether or not the decision to summon the National Guard and to declare the emergency was in itself provocative. I mean, there is a sense that by preempting what might happen, you might provoke something right. to happen that would not take place otherwise. I think we should all wait for what the grand jury decides and then we can make further judgments at that Gary. point. Gary, he was asked about the provocation on the call and said this was one of the things that he had to weigh against right. the dangers of public safety, which I think is an astute observation of what you want the governor to say. But to the point about the sort of stuttering answer, it wasn't just that it took him a while to get to the answer. The reporter on that call actually asked him a follow-up question, right. said, I want to be clear, who is in charge? And he didn't, he again it's missed a very answer. clear opportunity to, right. to okay. take responsibility, which will be forced on him regardless. And, and don't you you think just briefly, uh, Garrett and others on the panel, that's a failure of the staff. I mean, the staff of the governor right. needs to sit him down before that news conference and say, yeah. look, you will be asked this question. Right. Be prepared right. to answer it. Right. And simple, they have not done so. What a simple question. Right. I mean, and he should a, be ready that, to answer. That's a yes. Are you in charge yeah. or are you not in charge? Yes. And that was playing out now on a national right. platform on oh, all right. the TV newscasts. I, I, we have a lot of other things I want to tackle, but let me just go into this, uh, Eric Weston. Governor Nixon also this week appointed a new state commission tasked with helping Ferguson heal. A business owner, two ministers, a community activist, and a police detective are among those picked to the independent panel created to study the underlying social and economic conditions in Ferguson. The 16-member commission made up of nine black and seven white members will make recommendations in a report due by September of next year. Why so long? It's probably going to take them that long to get together, and they've got so many problems there, it'll probably take them that long to sort them out. But we're going to, it's going to take us a year, though, to learn the lessons then of Ferguson? Uh, I think the lessons have been learned. There's some problems there. How do we deal with the problems? What's the solution? We've known that there were problems there before, but now what's the solution to those problems? You're dealing with a city that had uh, curfews on African Americans after 10 o'clock. It was a sundown uh, city. So why now all of a sudden? And it looks like a dog and pony show. But one thing that I, I did want to say with the National Guard, it gave the national impression that he already knows that the officer is going to be found not guilty and not indicted. Yeah. So everybody's on edge now based upon him coming out so early being prepared. The commission is interesting, I think in part because it's designed to show that he is doing something now. The results of when this report come in will be studied a little bit by academics. They'll probably get some ink in newspapers and maybe some mention on television. But this is an, this is an opportunity for a governor who's been embattled over this whole issue to say, this is what I'm doing right now, when his options are fairly limited. But for the most part, it looks bad because if that was the case, this is something that should have been done a long time ago. It's, you're reacting instead of being pro. Active, I think you know, we, we focus a lot picture. on local. This is the focus of this program is on local issues. But when the national news network started showing maps this week of the hotly contentious Keystone pipeline that came up for a vote in Congress this week, I couldn't help noticing that the mammoth oil pipeline at the center of all this political kerfuffle would flow directly through Kansas. While we think of this as a national story that doesn't touch us, why don't we hear more about this local dimension to the story? Would we be getting thousands of jobs, cheaper gas, lots of new businesses being created if this massive project is green-lighted, Garrett? No, is the short answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the section of the pipeline that goes through Kansas is already built. Okay. So the opportunity for that economic uh, boom has sort of already passed through. And typically these pipelines, you get a, you do get sort of a boost as they're built, as they come through your area. And then after that, the biggest opportunity for a state or community to make money off of them is through taxation. And in Kansas, this pipeline is shielded from taxation for another 10 years. So the opportunity for an economic boom off of it is has come and gone. But I will say that on the flip side of that coin, we also can can see quite clearly that in this case, at least in Kansas, the environmental fears are uh, overplayed as well. Uh, there was no giant construction accidents. Uh, pipeline leaks are relatively rare, and, and pipelines are generally considered to be a safer way to transport oil than by train 
or by truck. And the oil that is going to be tapped in Canada is going to be tapped regardless of whether this pipeline is ever finished. So it's a little bit of hyperbole on both sides of this uh, I, I did get a, a chuckle, however, about the enthusiasm of senators from every other state through which the pipeline will not go <laughs> to build the thing, while there is in Nebraska some concerns about construction of the pipeline, mm -hmm. the environmental concerns, there are lawsuits involved. Nebraskans are much more ambivalent about the Keystone XL than is commonly known. Uh, Garrett's right, in Kansas the experience has been pretty benign, but it's classic congressional behavior to sort of say, yes, let's build this thing as long as it's not right. in my state, let's go, let's go to town. Just as same-sex couples on both sides of state line are being issued marriage licenses for the first time, the limits of those rights are being tested. This week's City Union mission is coming under fire for deciding that legally married gay couples won't be allowed to stay together at the shelter, even though the nonprofit accommodates other married couples. Leaders of the homeless facility say it violates the group's Christian principles. City Union mission says their policy has caused a backlash. Dan Doty, who runs the 90-year-old shelter, says he never imagined the magnitude of the repercussions. It's costing them sponsors, he says. But if you're a private organization, are you allowed to choose who you serve and who you don't? Uh, absolutely. I mean, they take no federal, state, local money, and this is within their prerogative. And they're not saying they won't serve you. They're saying you have to abide by certain rules if you come in. If you're a gay couple who wants to come in, you can stay yeah. in separate rooms. They're is this no different than the Boy Scouts? You know what? The, this is a solution looking for a problem. I said this on the radio. Why are they even talking about this? Yes, there is a high teen LGBT population that unfortunately gets kicked out of their home, let me say, and in up homeless and maybe goes to the city union mission. But I do want to say, while they allow um, heterosexual couples who are married to stay together, you have to present a marriage license. And let's just think about this for a moment, okay? <clears throat> You're homeless. You've just lost your home. You are kicked out on the streets. You have nothing but the clothes on your back. Where are you going to find your marriage license? Do you know where your marriage license is? The only reason I know where mine is is because we got married Saturday. <laughs> Who is going to have their marriage license? No one is staying together in the city union mission because no one is going to present a legal document when they're homeless and they're wandering into the city union mission seeking shelter. Why don't we just help the homeless? I don't care if you're gay or you're straight or you're black or you're purple or you're green. Why don't we just all be homeless and help the homeless? regardless of who you're staying with because yeah. no one is staying in the same place. Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, while it is true that as a private organization the City Union Mission is able to make a determination as to whether or not it will allow same-sex couples, the reality is we are in for a long period of litigation and legislation over this very topic. That's what some of the uh, discussion has been about requirements, for example, that florists provide flowers to same-sex married couples. You know, the idea that, that, that private enterprises can discriminate on the basis of same-sex marriage will be under legal challenge going forward. Governor Brownback, Sam Brownback in Kansas, I, said, I think said yesterday, I, I read a story, that he will not allow same-sex married couples to enjoy the benefits that might accrue in the state of Kansas, joint tax returns, that type of thing. That will be the subject of some litigation too. So I, I do think that we're in for a period and this is a representative of that, of a lot of discussion, debate, legal challenges, and others to what it means to be married yes, uh, for people. And so of the you same say, sex. isn't this just the beginning it is. of what we're seeing now as yes. a result of the, what is the very big, you know, it, I, I am sure I did not live through it here in the United States. But when you think about the civil rights movement in, in here, Eric, mm -hmm. uh, it took a long time for people to accept the rules that came down and the laws that came down in the United States when it came to accepting uh, African. Americans and, and allowing equal rights, it didn't happen overnight. Right, but I, I think people recognize the difference between the civil rights struggle and, and same-sex marriages. I think those are two different. One is a little more social than the other, but it's, you're right. It too, and people still haven't accepted the civil rights issues and the laws that have changed for that. The same-sex thing, good luck. We're in for a long ride on that one. A Kansas City, Missouri city councilman under fire over allegations that he choked his aide is continuing to maintain his innocence this week. Councilman Michael Brooks went about the people's business as usual at City Hall. There has been a suggestion that a group of African-American community leaders are encouraging him to step down. Eric Wesson, is there any evidence that Councilman Brooks is preparing to leave office? No, absolutely not. 
uh, he's still waiting for the investigation to conclude and then decide what to do after that. It's, it's, it's so many different dynamics to this, the African-American leaders, the clergy, and those things that are going into place <coughs> there. But the most alarming thing that has come up is, here's a guy that's under investigation, takes taxpayer money and gets to go on a trip yes. to look at the city of nations or whatever they do. But when you look at the district, there's no progress that supports him taking any of the trips that he's taken. If there were detour signs, construction, development, it would be an easier place for people to argue to support him. But since those things aren't taking place, he's just out there. Dana. The guy's a snake. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> My God, there's missing money, an allegation. The allegation. Uh, there's the oops, I texted my wiener to some women that I met on Facebook. I'm just going to say that. Let's not forget that. Uh, and now there's the latest choking incident. What? I'm sorry, did, is that the first time anyone's ever said wiener on your program? Yeah, we'll edit that out later. Okay. Um, so, um, what does it take to get a guy out of office? Do they have to have a recall election kit? And so we asked the city, what does it take to, uh, the guy to get out? And we were referred to the city charter. I couldn't believe that. So maybe you can answer that question. Well, well, well there is there is a mechanism for removing members of the council by other members of the council, but there is no mechanism for suspension or right. or some way to sort of say you're, you're, you're temporarily out of office. Of course, he could resign, and he faces the voters next year. So uh, the expense well. and difficulty of of a uh, of raising money and getting signatures for a recall might be. Yes. Might be and wasted, these I are all know. allegations. You are innocent until proven guilty, Garrett Hayes. Absolutely, but in the court of public opinion, he's going to have a very, very difficult time getting reelected. I mean, I pulled his uh, his uh, campaign finance documents. Right. He's got about sixteen hundred dollars in the bank. That does not does that get happen? you very far. Well, it, it has eight major donors. A few of them are uh, a few of them are local uh, faith leaders, and the largest is from the AFL-CIO of Kansas City, which said they will continue to support him yeah. unless these allegations are proven out. And I think it's interesting to note. He has sixteen hundred dollars left. What do the other council members have? Uh, Jermaine Reed has something like thirty-five or forty-five thousand. Yeah. So again, he, he does not, and he spent about twenty-five thousand getting elected last go round. So yeah. he does not have the money in the war chest that he had. He had a fundraiser scheduled last week. He had to cancel. I mean, yeah. he may, he, regardless of the results of this investigation, he may be on a very slow train out of City Hall electorally. That, Eric, Dana brings up a good point with the city charter, and th this is unprecedented. You've nev never had a city council person and go through the things that he's had to go through. But where is the dignity of being in office and being the elected official and the self-pride and saying, you know what, this has been a mess since I've been in here. Yeah. I've got no one to blame but myself. Why don't I do the noble thing and, and step, step aside? You, this is a guy that city taxpayers' dollars are going to be paying him a pension for if he finishes a four-year term. So all of this confusion, all of this madness and nonsense is going to cost the taxpayers for the now, rest of the Can I just say, yes. though, it is not unique. For, I mean, again, I'm not defending Michael Brooks, believe me. It isn't unique for members of the city council to face criminal charges and keep their seats. Charles Hasley was convicted, pled guilty on federal tax charges, and still served. There is no <laughs> mechanism for getting rid of council members uh, other than a vote of, the, uh, of their oh, colleagues. Yeah. There's no way to sort of step aside, take a leave of absence, any of that stuff. Now, maybe the charter should change to allow that. Yeah. But at this point, the only real way for him to leave office is for him to quit, the council members to kick him out based on whatever allegations are made, uh, or the voters doing the deed sometime next year. If Gary. he has the political capital, this would be an opportunity for the mayor also to step in and show some leadership and really lean on him too to say, regardless, gotta go. you've got to go. I mean, it's incumbent upon the mayor to defend the integrity of city government at the end of the day in the but same he, way we talk he about. He has been silent on this issue. He oh, has, yeah. and he's been very careful. I mean, this is a former trial attorney. Yes. He's not going to step on the legal process now during the middle of an investigation. But at the end of the day, right. on that sort of executive authority, he's the one who'd have to make that call or okay. could make that call. Next on Week in Review, is she simply voting her principles or eyeing a run for governor? I'm referring to Claire McCaskill. Last week, the Missouri senator announced she would oh, vote against Harry 
Harry Reid as Senate Democratic leader this week. She breaks with her party to vote with Republicans in favor of the Keystone Pipeline. McCaskill is also distancing herself from the president on immigration, saying she's not crazy about his use of an executive order to force policy change. Some are suggesting this has more to do with McCaskill positioning herself to run for governor in 2016 in Red State, Missouri. In response, she says, I could brush my teeth and it would increase speculation about whether I was running for governor. But here's the question. Wouldn't McCaskill have to be careful how she votes just to be reelected to her Senate seat? Why do her positions over the last week point to her fixation on replacing Jay Nixon as Missouri governor, Garrett? To be fair, clean teeth are very important for of course a they are. candidate. Of course they are. Uh, Claire McCaskill had a pretty good scare in 2012. If not for Todd Akin's self-destruction, she would have been one of the most, if not the most, vulnerable Senate Democrat. So she can read the tea leaves of what's going on in Missouri. But I think the idea that these are uh, positions that are setting her in line in favor of a gubernatorial run in 2016 is not far off base. I mean, she has essentially gone rogue in the U.S. Senate, and she has drifted way back towards the center now. That does two things. It positions her better to work with the Republican-controlled Senate for the next few years, but it absolutely sort of burnishes her independent streak credentials should she want to come home to Missouri and run. I, I will tell you that Republicans in Missouri really believe increasingly that she will be a candidate. And in fact, they're already thinking about ways to, uh, to confront her candidacy in 2016. Our understanding is the decision might not be made until early next year. If Claire McCaskill wasn't running, she could end the speculation tomorrow by sure. simply standing somewhere and saying, I'm not running under any circumstances. She hasn't done that. The other thing to pay attention to a little bit, Nick, is there is an increasing sense that Chris Coster will not run or not run for governor, may run for attorney general for re-election. He, he, this week, issued some new guidelines on fundraising. He was really hammered by the New York Times story about his alleged conflicts of interest. And again, Democrats and even some Republicans think that, that Coster's gubernatorial campaign may come to an end relatively quickly. He doesn't have a governor campaign committee. If you go look for a Coster for Governor website, it doesn't exist. So, I, I, you know, the dynamic is playing itself out. I think sometime in January we'll know how it all works out. So who would run against Claire McCaskill, Eric? Uh, he would, he's terming out as attorney general. He's done the two terms on that one. Yeah. I, I believe the McCaskill clo uh, people close to her said that if it looks like that Costa can't win, then she would get into the race. But let me just say, uh, we'll check and we'll have this next week. I'm not sure the attorney general is term limited in Missouri. Jay Nixon served as, ter as attorney general for many, many, many terms. The governor is term limited. Oh, but okay. you could run for AG again, I think. I, I'm willing to stand corrected. So. Uh, the guess is that Coster may be considering that alternative rather than, than face McCaskill. On the Republican side, Tom Schweik is rumored to get in, and Catherine Hannaway, the former U.S. attorney and speaker of the Missouri House, is a candidate as well. Thursday marks the Thanksgiving holiday. So show me family, all the blood that I will bleed. As families celebrate in their own unique ways around the metro, we at KCPT will be celebrating too. There will be no Week in Review next week. We are being preempted by a festive PBS special, 50 Years of Peter, Paul and Mary. But in the spirit of thanks, panelists, fill in the blank on this sentence. This Thanksgiving, Metro Kansas City can be thankful that blank. Dana Wright. That you can edit this program. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think we will have very little of the program left if we're going to be editing all of your statements from this program. <laughs> That's it. That's my okay, answer. Okay, thank you for that one. <laughs> What can we be thankful for uh, this Thanksgiving thankful uh, in for the, Metro Kansas City, Garrett? Thankful for the, the Royals run. Yes. I don't think the city's come together around anything like that in a very long time. Excellent. Um, Dave Helling. <laughs> uh, I, I, obviously, I second the Royals' opinion. It was a phenomenal, fabulous time in this community. I think we can be thankful a little bit, Nick, that we had a good, honest, solid debate in Kansas over the direction of the state. We had, uh, uh, you know, credible candidates for the U.S. Senate, credible candidates for the governorship. The issues were aired fully, completely. Both sides were well-funded. We had a good, honest discussion of where the state should go, and for that, and then we got to vote, and for that, we should be thankful. 
Eric. That the homicide rate is down yeah. and that you don't live in New York where they have seven feet of snow. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's a great point. You know, we, we shortchanged this earlier when we talked about it, but, you know, the Daryl Forte, the police chief, talking about his own reaction and response to what might happen as a result of Ferguson in our own community. What, what are they expecting may happen here? They might have some peaceful demonstrations, but Kansas City doesn't have a history of violent demonstrations like that. So he's pretty much got it under control. And I think people are embracing it by the uh, grand jury and the prosecutor in Ferguson releasing information a little yes. bit at a time, letting people know, hey, this might not go the way you want it to go, so get ready. That kind of ease and some of the changes. I think it's important to remember there are so many protesters who want to do it correctly, who have a message and a broad message that they want to share with America. And, and it, we got to be careful not to paint all of those protesters with a broad brush. And yes, there are a few bad apples, but it's important that we remember there are some good people out there who have a message and they have the right to share that message and, and they have the right and, and we should listen to their message and forget about the bad apples. Well, well I don't think we're going to see any of that in Kansas City. I really don't. Garrett. Yeah, I was going to agree with Eric here and give uh, Chief Forte a, a little bit of a tip of the hat, too. When there were those uh, protests in support of Ferguson here in Kansas City down on the plaza, KCPD officers did an exceptional job of just staying out of the way. Yeah. And there were a few officers on horseback. They were 100 yards away from the nearest protesters. It was clear that they were there were a presence, but it was in no way sort of threatening or provocative or anything else. And a good lesson for other cities that you can do this in a responsible way. And that is our pre-Thanksgiving week in review. Our thanks to Garrett Hake from 41 Action News and Eric Wesson from The Call. She is 50% of Dana and Parks, 2 to 6 weekdays. <laughs> yes, absolutely. On 981 <laughs> FM KMBZ, Dana Wright. And you'll find him on your driveway most mornings from the Kansas City Star Dave Helling. And my wife's getting fed up of it. She almost hit you with a minivan. <laughs> I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Happy giving of thanks. And that starts with me saying thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.